The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and today we're gonna to be looking back at some multimeters. So I'm guessing when we talk about multimeters, you're probably thinking something along the lines of one of these, maybe thinking of a benchtop digital multimeter, something along those lines. But of course, these are reasonably modern microcontroller based multimeters. What happens if we go back in time? There is one name and one brand which particularly stands out to people that know their old equipment, and that's Avometer. Now this is a tragically faulty uh, Avometer. Um, Avometer, the name Avometer comes around from uh, their logo, which of course is amps, volts and ohms. Avo. I always like that. So this is a vintage DA116 Avometer. Now, much like any modern multimeter, you can see all the settings, the plugs on the front, exact and digital readout, exactly as you'd kind of expect. Now this particular meter, the DA116, actually hails from 1977. So this is old. And surprisingly, still works. Now, I don't actually have leads that will fit this, but we don't really need to test it to know it probably still works. And AC range 40, the reason I managed to get hold of this is because it's broken anyway. So again, don't worry, we're not destroying anything. And this is a piece of history I'd kind of like to keep in one piece if I can get it back together. So let's go for it. Uh, hopefully, given the age of this and the high build quality, which I would expect from a piece of kit like this, it should be reasonably straightforward to take apart. I should say that this gasket around the edge is actually slightly rubberized. So when the meter is sat down on a surface, it has a little bit of grip so it doesn't just slide around. Now you can see this looks like it's probably been repaired or something before the AVO stickers have all been, uh, all got screws punched through them. Possibly not repair, that may well just be the calibration process that things like this have to go through. So, four batteries. So AVO Meter as a company released their first meter in the 1920s. I mean, it, it kind of kind of seems strange to me that multimeters go back that far, but sure enough they do. Um, AVO's most popular meter was uh, actually an analog meter, not a digital meter, uh, and that was the Model 8 and was very, very prolific. Originally released in the 1950s, and they kept that going right up until 2008. I know what you're thinking, why would you keep an analog meter in production for over 60 years? or just about 60 years anyway. And the answer is very simple. The analog meter, or the nature of it, meant that you didn't have to have batteries. Now that gives you certain abilities and places you could work, which made it more intrinsically safe. Oh, I should read, oh. Look at the wound leads to the battery banks. So same size screws, six screws, and you're in. And that's pretty much it. That was a little uh, ceramic, maybe plastic. And it feels a bit like these tubes. Th these were spaces between the two PCBs that sat on these riser posts. Honestly, that kind of, they kind of feel like they're like a resin impregnated cardboard. When the, they definitely look like they're paper and they're textures. Could be fiber reinforced plastic or resin. So what would you use in 1977? This is the, sc the screen protector, the dust protection, if you will, and it's an actual sheet of glass, not plastic, not perspex, actual glass. So the posts actually have little slotted uh, heads that you can get a screwdriver into. Lovely touch. Really useful if you know it's there too. So that frees the meter to the rear. Let's Unscrew the next terminal, which I think is the negative. Fusible link, again, that's... That actually is a plastic or a resin. But yeah, a little fusible link between 
positive and the negative, and I've just thrown a load of washers everywhere. Okay, four washers, that makes sense. That would be for the four screw posts. How do you get this last terminal off? Aha, this terminal's actually got screw slots from the front, but I'll need a bigger screwdriver. Okay, bigger screwdriver's sourced. Yeah, another fuse. Okay, so you can change the fuse on the front without having to take it apart. That's interesting. Right over here, you've got what looks like a grounding lug. And there's just a little bit of sort of silver foil on the inside here, which I can only assume means this gray paint on the inside is conductive. You see, it's kind of touches there. There's a similar arrangement on the bottom half. A little bit of shield. So I'm guessing that means this is like a ground shield. It, it stops interference, gives you more stable readings. Okay, it looks like the battery terminals are actually pressed onto. Okay. I'm actually pressed onto a little terminal so they are removable, which makes a lot of sense for repair and accessibility that we can just unplug those. But I've got to say this, this coiled wire arrangement, gorgeous. It means you've got enough length to actually remove the PCB. The wires aren't going to get in the way anywhere when you're trying to put it back together. Why can't we do that? Is that little extra couple of inches of wire going to make that much difference to manufacturers? I'm sure I would be told yes. Now, I find it weird that if you were joining two PCBs today, you would definitely use 2.54 millimeter header pins. And on this, we've got this little zebra striped, I mean, it is a PCB, but it's like on a piece of half millimeter fiberglass, maybe plastic. And it just goes into these sort of edge connectors there and there. It's just not something you see any these days. Now, I have made mistakes with rotary encoders like this from period electronics before. Um, I found to my detriment that a, uh, a head selector on an old tape deck was made up of a plastic molding and dozens of tiny little pins of different lengths, which sort of made up half of the encoder. And when you took it apart, it was stacked up three layers high and the bits just went everywhere. So I'm very wary of removing this captive nut off the back here, but I will. Uh. Oh, I can feel it happening already. Yeah, there you go. So, three contacts, only two springs, that's not a good. Here you go, one, two, three springs, and the same on the reverse. So three little bus bars and three little springs. Let's keep all that together to one side. And you can see where some contact cleaner wouldn't go amiss, where it's just sort of slipped around this ring of uh, inner and outer traces, and depending on which pair is in which position as to which ones make up. And of course the front and back were actually locked together and did exactly the same on the back as well. And because there's three radially, you have the option of connecting or breaking up to six traces in any given position. And you see that these have got gaps in between the uh, traces on the uh, PCB as well which makes me think that, yeah, that was the power switch. So, all right, you're not gonna get a ton of draw off of these. I think the manual for this said you get 500 hours of operation off of a set of four batteries. So, I mean, my main question really is, do I desolder these two wires and potentially the positive inputs just for the sake of completeness on a good teardown? Guess I should really, shouldn't I? Okay. A little bit of heart stopping desoldering, and I don't know if you've ever worked on anything old like this, but when you reheat that solder, you get that kind of vintage fluxy smell. Um, I don't know what you would have to do these days to reproduce that and probably have a factory with 300 people in it and cigarette smoke and whatever, but it's quite distinctive. Okay, so we now have these two disconnected, which attached here and here, helpfully numbered 16, 17, 16, 17. And we also, I desoldered this uh, lug from the fusible link over here. I don't really know why it's soldered quite so messily, but 
it is and I wanted it in pieces so here we go. Also desoldered the positive terminals over here. Okay so got the last large encoder which was mechanically paired so this band actually penetrated through the first PCB onto here. So these two large encoder wheels were actually synchronized together and one two three four so we've got four on the front and one just a single on the back. Again, I'm probably going to lose this. If anyone knows of a good technique or a way to get these off without losing an eyeball, I'd love to hear it. Love this little design of the springs inside. They're just all these individual actual components, which are what will have given it the quality and the build to have lasted for so long. But they're something you would instantly try and lose to save on manufacturing cost because and I'm pretty sure I'm going to experience this later, assembling those will be a pain. Hi, this is future David from about two and a half hours time. Spoiler alert, they were a pain to put back together. And uh, yeah, there you go. You can see one, two, three, four, five contacts on the front. And there we go. Lots and lots on the back. Okay, so there is one thing I've got to say for old circuitry like this. And it's before you get computer assisted design for PCB layouts, because this will have been designed by, and I hope this is not some sort of offensive cliche, but this would have been designed by those old guys in white lab coats with the big beards, always smoking a pipe at a whiteboard. And it's this hand designed fluid layout that software, as far as I'm aware, doesn't do. That is hand drawn. Somebody literally filled that in with ink and ran it all together. And that would transfer would have been used to etch the PCB. And I love that old hand design PCB layout. There's something charming about that that you just don't get anymore. Anyway, this is very helpfully labeled the power supply board. So you can already read and understand what this does. Over here, we have the main PCB assembly. And we do actually have a couple of integrated circuits over here. Um, we'll have to see if we can get the screen off, get a little bit, or at least the cowling around the screen and have a look at what they are. Yeah, there you go. It's got that funky sort of italic, slightly swept forward layout, which you don't see often. I'll give it that. And another feature, which I've just noticed, um, these two here, these two sort of metallically insulated holes uh, or metallically filled holes, they actually correspond to the the uh, screw holes in the back of the plastic. So two of those screws actually go straight into the lugs on the PCB. Now. It's only a single layer PCB front and back layout and holding this thing up to the light again, that organically hand drawn PCB layout, incredibly low density. I mean, you can see why modern multimeters are about a third of the size of this, but that is a work of art. Anyway, so over here, the few integrated circuits we actually have is an M the Motorola MC14433. Uh, we also have down here a CD400 1BE and just to add to the fun and MC3476 P1. Now the best thing about old electronics is I don't have to look what these parts are. I don't have to understand it because when manufacturers used to publish their documentation, they would include full circuit diagrams, full wiring diagrams. If I wanted to, I could take the information in the back of this manual, buy the components off the part list build it myself. All right, I say that one could, I'm not sure I could, but you know what I mean. Actually, that could be a fun project one day is to try and build a hand-wired multimeter, maybe one for someone with better soldering skills than me. Now, the last thing I really am intrigued about is this little daughter board on the power board. It's got these little, I mean, honestly, if I didn't know the age of this device and was looking at it, I would say this was a little antenna board. It looks very, very similar to some of the antenna traces we've seen on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built into things. But I cannot fathom what that is. And they kind of very slightly have these... Oh, this is actually just a heatsink for high current paths because that's, that's metallic. So where you're actually measuring high current power, uh, you've got components measuring through it, you would have a lot more heat dissipation going through the traces. And rather than making the traces bigger, you put the traces on a heatsink, essentially. 
that's the only reason I can think of that. I would be inclined to say that's a piece of steel. Maybe aluminium. I think it's aluminium. Sorry, aluminium. Well, there you have it. The great, great grandparent of your multimeter that you're using at home, particularly if you've somehow got a hold of a megameter. The quality of old stuff like this, I mean, I can't imagine any of my multimeters still working in 50 years. Uh, from 1977 to now, that's, that's a, a hell of a long run. And for one single component, which we could probably track down and replace to make it fully functional again, just doesn't compare to modern equipment. I just think this is a great example of sort of the lineage of the tools that we use and where they've come from and the lengths that people had to go to to design products. And I just am such an enormous fan of these hand laid out traces and PCBs. I think they're fantastic. I hope you've enjoyed this teardown as much as I have. Uh, if you've got an idea for a teardown that you'd like to see, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Don't forget to check out our other Wednesday shows, which are Workbench Wednesdays with James and The Learning Circuit with Karen. And of course, we're always here with Friday Projects. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.